Um, so this is a, a talk that I volunteered to do a couple of days ago, just to um, give a, a bit of an overview of Blu-ray DVDs, what, how they work, what they store. That's kind of a, an interesting thing for free software in the sense that a, it's a, an entertainment medium that we don't currently have a very good way of, of accessing, but also as a way of keeping track of what the proprietary competition are doing and the and interesting sorts of things that we could be producing uh, open source alternatives to. So, go. So the disclaimer is that the, the I only put myself up for this talk two days ago, so it's a little bit rough uh, and thrown together. And um, it's also only an overview of things that I've learned about Blu-ray Blu over the last I don't know, six months or so that I've had a Blu-ray drive and played around with it a bit. And um, I should especially point out that I've never actually played a Blu-ray. I don't have uh, a PS3. I've never never uh, wandered around the menu system. So there are probably people in the room that have, have more of a consumer experience of how Blu-ray is actually supposed to work. I only have the sort of hacker perspective of tearing apart the, the thing a bit. So a bit about Blu-ray. Um, it's a new type of, of disc, uses a finer dot pitch, so it can store a lot more data than DVD did. The basic capacity is 25 gig or 50 gig, depending on whether they put a single layer or dual layer on the disc. I think similar to DVD, that the, the only Blu-ray burners we'll see for a long time are single layer burners, which means that it's very unlikely that at any point you'll be able to copy Blu-rays, like you can't really copy DVDs very easily. There is a uh, dual-layer um, Blu-ray version of OG. Okay. This one. Um, so they, they store a, a UDF file system like DVD did. And like DVD, they have a BD-ROM special area that only the drive can access that normal consumer drives can't write. So that's where they store encryption keys that, again, mean you can't take a commercially bought Blu-ray movie and just copy it identically because you won't get the mark area that contains the the decryption key triggers. So that's not very visible, uh, although it sort of works. Uh, here's a bit about what you actually get if you put a Blu-ray disc in your drive and, and have a look at it. Uh, down the bottom of the, the listing here is the, the start of it all as far as a Blu-ray player goes, is this movie object and index uh, binary blobs <laughs> that start pointing into the other data that's on the disk. You've got a directory of playlist files, a directory of clip info files, the stream directory that actually contains the interesting movie bits, uh, some Java objects, some possibly auxiliary data, uh, possibly a certificate subdirectory where the, the decryption keys or the AACS information is, is, a, is visible, minus the bit that's kept private by the drive that you have to get by talking to the drive with IOctals, and some JAR files. Uh, so in the encryption that Blu-ray uses, you, you've probably heard of, the AACS encryption, which is an AES-based uh, encryption of the the media content only. You can use, like DVD, you can go and read all the metadata, and it's only the actual stream, the video stream, that gets encrypted. The really nasty part about Blu-ray uh, compared to DVD is that they actually got the encryption right this time in the sense that it, I don't think it's going to be broken as hard as DVD was at any point. Um, it, it's a stronger encryption. It's not a silly five-byte XOR thing that, that, in, that you know, a 16-year-old Norwegian will figure out. <laughs> Which doesn't mean there could, there's not a flaw in it somewhere, and clearly there's, there's the usual flaw that we see the keys get found out and published and then people have the keys, they can decrypt it. They have the, this nasty mechanism going on with the subset difference tree system, uh, which basically a allows them to set up rolling sets of, of keys. So there's this ongoing turf war with 
with the people making Blu-ray movies where someone finds out the keys for the current set of discs and publishes them on the net and a few months later discs stop being manufactured with those keys and start being manufactured with a new set of keys. That, um, if you then buy one of those discs, you put it in the drive, you close the drive door and before you've even attempted to mount it or look at anything on the disc, the drive has already sucked a new set of keys off the thing and updated its internal set so that you can no longer use a player that is using the older keys at all. So now all your discs are useless until you go and update your player with new software and new keys. So this is kind of the way that they force people to keep upgrading their keys and they, you know, the plan was that they protect the, the content on the disc that way. It's really nasty, really, really ugly. Uh, and is probably going to be a, a battle of wills for some time to come. Uh, there's a, a link down the bottom here about the AACS encryption key controversy that was, I think it was 2007, that the first set of keys were published and the Muslik 64 uh, first AACS decryptor appeared that used those keys to start pulling fully decrypted streams off the disk. And, as if that wasn't enough, they also use this nasty system called BD Plus on a bunch of disks where before they encrypt the streams and put them on the disk, they first corrupt them and they, they take bytes here and there throughout the stream and replace them with uh, little segments of, of random data. And then they have a setup where the player that wants to run this, one that wants to play the content, has to run the BD Plus virtual machine and they have a set of virtual machine instructions that you execute. And that virtual machine can do various operations. It, it has a set of system traps it can execute that can do things like test how long does it take for the drive head to move from this point to that point and then you have to return the correct timing and the VM does some calculation based on that or they can inspect the running memory of the, the player and the whole idea is that they have a Turing complete thing that can go and check its operating environment and not allow you to have the, the correction factors to play the media unless it decides that you're valid. Fortunately, BD Plus, at least for the... So they have a full Turing complete machine. What they haven't got yet is any really sophisticated programs for, for running on it. So the programs they have so far are pretty well understood. There's a debugger that you run over it. It simulates the virtual machine. It calculates the output and it gives you the conversion table at the end that is go and correct these bytes here to this, this these bytes here to this, and you get a set of things that you can go and correct the decrypted stream. For the moment, at least, BD Plus is fairly well broken which is good because that means that you can do the interesting thing you actually want to do, which is to get at the MPEG transport stream data that's on the disk and watch the movie you've paid for. Uh, so here's a little bit about what you, what you get when you actually get the streams. You have an MPEG transport stream is the basic container for the whole thing. Runs it up to 54 megabits per second. Uh, that you, that, that, that's the peak that you have to be able to, to pull off the disk. Inside that is one of three video formats, either H.264, VC1, or MPEG2. So if you want to play Blu-ray, you need at least these three decoders to be able to play every disc. Uh, and I have, I have discs that are using each. Uh, the video itself goes up to 40 megabits per second for 1080p content, which can look, pr look quite pretty when it peaks. There's these five basic resolutions for for the video, the, the well-known 1080p one. There's a 1080, uh, 1440 by 1080 anamorphic mode that is used because Blu-ray has a lot in common with the HDV, um, AVC HD format. And so uh, a lot of these HDV cameras capture this anamorphic 1440 by 1080 and you can write it onto a disc that a lot of Blu-ray players will be automatically able to read. 720p and DVD backwards compatibility stuff that authors who 
just want to sell Blu-rays but don't actually want to do any real work to improve the quality of the content that they're putting on there, can just take the special features that they recorded for DVD and plonk them straight on a Blu-ray and then sell it to you for 50% more. Uh, on the audio side of things, there's a whole bunch of formats they can choose that are um, most, except for the bottom two, are, are mandatory. Uh, so there's the usual suspects from DVD, AC3, DTS, LPCM. Uh, MP3 was actually allowed on DVD but isn't anymore. And then there's the new formats, the enhanced AC3, it's Dolby Digital Plus, it's the other name for that one, uh, and DTS HD. And then there's these two lossless formats that are the, the really high quality ones that a, a few discs come with, and especially your con music concert DVDs. Uh, Dolby True HD, which is related to the MLP protocol, the codec that was used on um, DVD audio. And the DTS Master Audio, which is a uh, just basically a, a straight DTS track with an enhancement bitstream in it that you, that gives you corrections for the lossiness. So you, a straight DTS decoder can decode it as lossy DTS, or you can get one that uses the enhancement layer to then give you lossless bits back out of the, the stream. Uh, then there are two types of presentation graphics streams that uh, the Blu-ray supports. One, well, one, presentation graphics and interactive graphics that are used, PGS streams are used for your subtitles throughout the movie, and the interactive graphics ones that give you your menuing system, buttons, or clippable stuff, and you can simultaneously have presentation graphics on the screen and have a menu popped up while the video is playing underneath. Um, which th th this is one of the things that, like I said, is just uh, this is stuff that I've figured out from looking at the Blu-rays I own. It looks like the it requires you to have three or four alpha blended layers that are running simultaneously. I think it's four, so that you can have a 1080p video running in one layer. You can have an alpha blended sub uh, picture in picture layer running to have a the director's commentary can pop up with a little picture of the director running in a corner. Uh, and then you can have the two overlay graphics layers running on top of that. So that's why a lot of the hardware that Blu-ray players are being built out of come with these four alpha blended layer planes as their standard graphics, 2D graphics things, where they on the CPUs where they're not choosing to integrate a full GL stack. Uh, some other interesting things they've got on the, well, the menuing system comes in two flavours. There's a simpler menuing system that is somewhat like DVD where you can just set up a, a navigation structure, wander through it and have buttons presented that take you to another piece of the navigation structure and that's, that's pretty much what DVD allowed. It, you, can, it, it, you have a something of a Turing complete VM on a DVD but it's, it's pretty limited. No one ever really made use of it. Uh, so they have something like that menuing system for Blu-ray, but then they also have the full uh, BDJ profile. It's called the Blu-ray Blu Java profile, where the menus are actually these Java Xlets, they call them, and they use a, a widget system supplied by the the operating system, and they can really run a full computed Java menu system, which puts some interesting requirements on the the players especially in, when also the full Blu-ray play, uh, playback profile specifies that the discs have access to up to a gigabyte of local storage as well. So it's not, not really an embedded appliance anymore. It really is something you need like a PS3 to, to do. Uh, I mentioned they support picture-in-picture picture as well, so you can have your director's commentaries. And then all the usual DVD features of multi-angle switching, uh, menu systems, subtitles, sub-picture tracks, multiple audio. So these are the bits that are currently understood by the, the open source community and people that are trying to reverse engineer the standard. The decryption is fairly well understood, at least for the moment, up to a certain point uh, on the, the, the 
state of the art on the Windows side of things is a bit further along than we can go on on Linux on Windows. You can go and you can pay for a piece of software called any any DVD that also these days supports Blu-ray, and they somewhere in there have the ability to access all currently known disks. So they have access to keys that they haven't published widely, probably because they want to sell their software, but they don't want other people building equivalent bits of software, and they don't want the companies revoking those keys just yet. So decryption's understood up to about the MKB version 12 revision. Um, the disks themselves are somewhere up around the MKB version 14. So there's a, there is a set of disks that we can't get the keys for yet. And so under that, we can do decryption. We can read the MPLS files, which are the media playlist files, and that gives you the description of um, to play this particular movie, go and play this set of items, this set of clips they give you. So you follow those, you get to the clippy, clip info files that say to play the clip that's identified as clip number 32, go to this file on the disk and play this segment of the file. So that the clippy, clip info ones then chop up the actual MPEG transport streams into a set of clips. So that gives them a fairly flexible structure for plugging together different uh, program streams to uh, diff different programs so that you can have a, a um, down the rabbit hole style matrix thing, for example, that just references the main body of a movie that's stored once but then tells you to play this little chunk in the middle or whatever they can... they. You know, direct you through the video. So, because the video itself is such a high bitrate thing, and you don't want to be storing the same piece of video twice if you can avoid it. So, it's kind of cool to be able to just specify it as a set of chunks to be played in a particular order. And then the clip info ones send you to the actual transport stream files. So, how do we do? How do we use this stuff under Linux? That's the basic overview of what you get on a Blu-ray disc. Uh, here are some of the tools that that I've played with. Main one, the the core of it is this AACS keys, which is the one that you can you you get from somewhere like the Doom Nine forums. You get a text file with it that has the half a dozen processing keys that are known, and you run it on the drive. It gives you back information about the the disk that's in there at the moment. Then you can use the dump HD program to pull the the actual full copy of the disk off. Um, you can also use the BDMV debugger. That's called I, all of this stuff I get got, get from Doom Nine .forum.org or forum.doom9.org, and that'll that the the BDMV debugger can strip off the BD plus. Uh, nastiness on top. There is also a a guy somewhere in the world who runs a website called makemkv.com that has Windows, OS 10, and Linux clients. And makemkv is kind of nice. You give it the Blu-ray disc and the decryption information that you've extracted, and then it will pull it off and give you nicely formatted MKV files with the original video and audio and sub-picture streams. At the moment, there is no one-stop shop for a put a disc in and click play. Not not quite yet. Um, you still need to go and you, you rip these things to a, a hard disc before you play them. So that, that's kind of prepare yourself for hours of work before you go and watch your Blu-ray movie under Linux. You've got to wait for the whole thing to rip. Uh, the video formats and, and the audio and the, the graphics, mostly pretty well understood. Those that are not, um, there are workarounds. There was a Google Summer of Code project to implement Dolby True HD in FFmpeg. I haven't tried it out, but I think that, that got integrated recently, so that's newly in there um, and should be appearing in the players shortly afterward. The DTS HD variants, as far as I know, no one's got information about how to do the enhancement layers in those, but like I said, they degrade gracefully and you get 
you can you can treat them as an ETS stream and play them back lossily. Uh, and the intera inter interactive graphic streams are not yet understood, as far as I know. I haven't seen anyone parsing those. Uh, for the video, MPEG-2, H.264, VC1, you can go via FFmpeg or LibMpeg-2, um, AC3, LPCM, DTS. Similar story, we've got libraries for doing these. This one's pretty simple as a, it's a raw PCM format with a, a bit of byte swapping to get the content out. EAC3 is in FFmpeg. PGS is starting to appear in a, a few places. Uh, I implemented it in GStreamer. It's uh, v VLC have a parser for it that comes via FFmpeg these days. Um, so the challenges for playing this stuff, one, 1080p is a hefty, hefty video file to play um, this laptop struggles to play them with its 2.4 gig Core 2 Duo. Uh, it's the sort of thing that you really need hardware acceleration. Unfortunately, the hardware acceleration options under Linux, VA API and VDPAU are not uh, that plug and play. They don't, they're not used automatically by the players quite yet. If you do it with mPlayer, you have to explicitly turn on the command line options to use VDPAU. Uh, VA API the, is the, the Intel equivalent, uh, and I haven't played with it. I, I don't know if anyone here has played with VA API or knows how well that works for these these formats. Um, the other part is the alpha blending the display planes gets uh, a bit tricky to do in software. It's the sort of thing you really need to offload as well. So that means getting a OpenGL play back end or again going through the VDPAU to, to request blending of the display planes. There's the perennial problem that plagued us under DVD as well of getting multi-channel audio support working properly. No one's ever really solved that. You can stream stuff out the SPDIF port with some players, not with others. If you choose to decode it in software, then there's no really good way for getting multi-channel out. Still, it's, it's awkward to set up. It's getting a little bit better in the latest uh, Ubuntu releases with Pulse Audio, but I, I wouldn't call that a solved problem yet. And of course, the, the unsupported codecs that no doubt we'll see support for those appearing in the next year or two. So, so there are some players that have support for this stuff, at the very worst, you can grab out just the transport stream, even if you don't have, even if they don't yet support the clip info and playlist. Usually, the full movie is placed as one nice transport stream that you can just watch end to end, even if you you don't want to do any of the special features. So, for those, you can usually just feed them to one of the players and let it go. Uh, there are some problems. I'll do some demos in a little bit. Um, so, VLC is the only player I know of so far that started adding support for the clip info and playlist things. Uh, I haven't got that going yet, but I've seen it in the tree that you can, it, it can parse the, the playlists and the clip info and present them as uh, a playlist and separate chapters within the, the thing. And there are a few, the, there's the Lib Blu-ray uh, project that I, I've seen. It seems a little stagnant since October or so, but they have started with three subsections. They've got a AACS decryption. They have a BD Plus virtual machine simulation uh, and the starts of a clip info and playlist parser in there. Uh, and the, uh, the thing that no one is touching so far, as far as I've seen under Linux, is the ability to support all the Java features of Blu-ray. And I think that's partly because we don't know how to parse a whole bunch of the objects that tell you which bits of Java to execute or what their runtime environment should look like. So there's, there's a big long road ahead of the community in terms of trying to reach where we can, what we can do with DVD there. Um, but at some level, the answer is that the players have to start in implementing a Java in uh, the libraries that they're calling. Uh, and running that via JNI or GCJ or something like that. So 
that was pretty quick. Does anyone have any questions? Yeah? Um, do you know anything about the 3D the stuff? Understand PlayStation and getting for the... No. No, nothing. I've, I've heard that they are planning to start selling that sort of stuff now that uh, 3D TVs are supposed to hit the shelves in the next couple of months in the US and have their shutter-based glasses that you have to wear or um, polarised lens ones in some cases. And then later there's supposed to be a wave of TVs where you can sit and not have to wear any glasses but just look at the, the thing. But And so the, the Blu-ray 3D stuff is going to be targeted at those. But I don't know even what they're using for their encoding, whether it's two separate streams or whether it's an interlaced stream that's, that's one eye per field or what they're doing there. Um, any other questions? Otherwise I might just show some of the file formats and things like that. Um, so here's lib Blu-ray, pretty basic sort of library at the moment. Uh, it has some examples. You can run. Uh, I can't really actually demo with any disks because this computer doesn't have a Blu-ray drive. The Blu-ray drive is in a whole other machine on a whole other continent. But anyway, you can... Uh, where's my stuff? Over here somewhere. So they, they, yeah, they just have this dump thing. It can show you the the information that's in a clip file. Uh, I have my own version of that that I've been that I was working on before I discovered Lib Blu-ray. Basically, you know, this, this is all pretty low-level, really early days stuff. Just parsing the files, getting out a list of the clip, and find out that there's program file that has um, one program stream, gives you the, the PIDs in the MPEG transport stream, tells you what, if you, if you know how to parse the attached data, it tells you the format, it tells you the, the language for the subtitles. Um, what else have we got? We have some, some of these rips. I am not in the right environment here. <coughs> so one of the other challenges with Blu-ray is because it's 1080p, often a lot of what you're doing that's new is downscaling the video to fit onto the display device. That's um, something that's uh, not quite as expected. So this is really how poorly this laptop does at, at decoding this sort of stuff. Um, if it manages to catch up to the video occasionally, it'll do a bit better, but it's really not watchable. Tell me this is the trailer, otherwise it's really unwatchable. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> nope, nope, that's it. Yeah, so this is, this is not even the trailer. It's a Blu-ray trailer that happens to feature King Kong footage. <coughs> And not really even visible on the projector. So yeah, if it gets going, once it decides to ramp the CPU up, it can do a bit better. <laughs> Just in case someone comes along to your laptop and decides to <laughs> execute a denial of battery life attack. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> right. So that's a 1080p clip that once it gets going, it's kind of okay, but it, it still can get quite stuttery. Uh, this is also one that I ripped to MKV because MKV is a nicer format for 
seeking around and that sort of thing. So, so if I have a choice, I'd prefer to do that. In the longer term, though, I would prefer to to get all the pieces together so that I can just put the drive, the disk in the drive, have it decrypted on the fly, and um, the benefit of doing it that way is that you can use the the clip info uh, information. Another part of it here is the the seek table that you get inside in the the metadata tells you for a particular stream a whole set of PTS and packet offsets and it's MPEG transport stream so the packets are all in this case 192 bytes so you can go quickly to a byte offset from, from this information. They do it in a kind of interesting way um, which is which I was talking about at FOMS but the, they have the seek table split up into two separate layers where they give you a course table uh, and then the course table has the most significant bits of a particular PTS and, and, by, and packet offset that you're looking for and a, in, an index into the, the find table that then gives you the, the least significant bits. So they split it up as a two layer search. It helps them keep the space down and you do two lookups into two tables and can get a very nicely fine grained jump for a particular timestamp straight into the packet. Uh, it also tells you where angle switches are, which is an interesting thing for multi-angle titles, not that I have any yet. Uh, and then there's some other unknown bits in here that, that are just marked out as unknown numbers in the packet. So yeah, in, in conjunction with the if, with with the clip info, you can do nice seeking on the transport stream, which is not not something that's usually easy to do on a, a random transport stream where the the um, PCR clock underlying clock might be discontinuous. Uh, what else have we got? Uh, PGS support was the other thing to show. So in DVD, the subtitles are presented as a 4-bit um, palette, a 4-bit four, four colour palette, so that usually means you have three colours available because one of them has to be transparent. In Blu-ray, they've bumped that up. This is a 256 colour bitmap, which means they get some prettier um, foreign characters. And so this is Totem with... Blu-ray support and with um, PGS sub-picture support. I don't know if you could actually see them there. Back here. Yeah. Okay. So again. Yeah. Switch keys. So that's a 256 color bitmap that gets uh, run length encoded and then placed into the transport stream as, a, as an extra auxiliary stream that you can choose, or in this case into the MKV file. So I think that pretty much covers it for the, for the demos I wanted to do as well. So I guess the, the thing I wanted to cover was a bit of an overview of how Blu-ray works and maybe think about how we would do these sorts of things with open technologies. Um, maybe even one day, how would you make a, an OG disk that encompassed all these features? Which language, languages would we choose to, to express the menus in? What, do, do we have the codec capability? Well, probably we do between Dirac and Theora and, and Vorbis to at least cover the media part, but do we have the sub-picture and subtitle support stuff? Um, is there anything at the moment that's good for editing Blu-ray clips? For accessing them? No, editing them. If editing. You pull something off 1080p, be it PC1 or H264. I, I wouldn't really say yes. I mean, you can... The, if they're in MKV, 
the usual sorts of suspects can import them, uh, except when you make it think that that's a... Small issue here in New Zealand is the using uh, 1080i H.264 for uh, broadcast TV. And at the moment, if you actually want to edit it down, take the ads out, do anything with it, say, take the ads out, turn it onto a Blu-ray, Mm -hmm. um, there's very few tools capable of doing it on, a, on Windows or Linux or any other No, no one's really writing authoring tools for producing Blu-ray content. Um, it's not even clear to me if you can manage to properly produce that. The uh, One of the things in the, that differed between HD DVD and Blu-ray is that players are not required to play unencrypted Blu-ray content. <laughs> so it's not it's not intended as a consumer oriented authoring format at all. They want you to have to pay for Yeah. And you can make A V C H D content and you can put that on a Blu ray disc and your player might support A V C H D as a variant that's similar to Blu ray and it might play that. But producing something that's identical to a Blu ray movie disc, as far as I know the the Consumer players are not required to actually recognise that as a valid piece of content because it won't have the encryption key and it won't have the, the BD-ROM mark area not populated. Not the manufacturer to choose to, or do the Blu-ray laws decide that you can't show consumer-generated content? It's not not clear to me whether the content man whether the the hardware manufacturers will be allowed to choose to play unencrypted content. The licensors may decide they're not going to allow them to have the Blu-ray mark unless they only support this. Why they would is a bit unclear. The only reason would be that they would want everyone who authors it to have to pay for the special drive that can burn the BD-ROM mark and therefore pay some money to the licensors. Mm -hmm. But I believe it's, I believe it's been played back to the industry to Panasonic Blu-ray players. Right. Okay. Thank you.